Welcome to another presentation where we're going to look at education as it moves into the future. All of this is centred around evidence. We need to plan education for the future in the light of evidence. And we're going to look at what research reveals and gives us the evidence. This is the eighth presentation in this series. And we're now going to move on to look at what research reveals about teacher education. What is the evidence that can guide us for the way forward? Now, across society, these statements are all true. People accept it without question. Doctors need training. Dentists need training. Physiotherapists need training. Nurses need training. Social workers need training. We could go on down that list. And the training must be rigorous and appropriate for the task in hand. And in every case, it's a combination of academic, book-based, and the clinical practical training. And these various professions have found ways to combine the two to some extent. Now, most in society take a similar view about teachers. To be a teacher, you need to be rigorously trained. But... There is a minority in society who hold the view that questions that. And they say, if you've got a degree in history, that qualifies you to go and teach history. Or any other discipline. And you don't need any training. Again, most people think that the training involves a combination of the academic and the practical. But here too there are question marks. The diversity across nations in the combination of these two is quite marked. Some teacher training is built around the academic with limited practical training, while in other countries the practical training takes a high profile. What is the balance point? Do we need both? And in what proportions? Let's pursue that just a little bit further. Could you actually do this and make the training simply based on apprenticeships, practical training, on the job? You train in schools with a mentor in the school. Someone perhaps who teaches the same subject discipline, who's experienced with a proven track record. Do we need the academic? And that raises the question, could you get rid of all the academic education courses? Could they all be steered out of the way? Do we actually need them? What do they bring to us? So you could cancel all the academic courses completely. Now, maybe you don't want to go as far as that. But ask the question, exactly what academic education courses are essential for teachers? Could we reduce the amount of academic and increase the time for learning on the job? So you restrict it. And on what basis do you do that? It all comes back to that. What's the balance between the academic and the practical in teacher education? And all professions which involve the academic and practical have to address that question. And the variation is very considerable. Who's right? What's the best way forward? And then you look at the actual training in education in many courses in the world Somewhere there's a research project the students are asked to do in education. Talk to the students leaves them utterly confused. They don't have enough background knowledge. They don't have enough background experience. They don't have a background in the classroom. They don't know the research literature. And in the end of the day, they do something which is of very limited value to anybody. And it's certainly of very limited value to themselves. Would it not be better to do that? That's been done in other disciplines extensively, where, for example, students can be given three or four papers that follow a sequence in some area of inquiry, and they're asked to summarize, bring it together, interpret the results, look at the way it's done. Could that not be done in education, and would that not be far, far, far more useful? So let's look at teacher education. You've got another number of dimensions here. You've got to know what you're talking about. Yes. 
So if you want to teach chemistry, for example, the would-be teacher needs to understand the chemistry and understand it at a high level so that does it, he doesn't or she doesn't mislead the students by an incomplete understanding. We'll look at what that really means in a moment or two. We need to understand how learning is known to take place. There is clear direction on this. The research has given us quite clear pictures to understand this. It's often left confused in the kind of academic theoretical courses that are offered, but the evidence is out there in the literature. And if you want to teach young people, you need to understand how young people learn. It's simple and it's practical, and the research evidence is there. But what about the actual practical skills of teaching? Watch a skilled teacher. It's mind-blowing. It's very impressive. The wonderful skills they have developed. How are you going to give, develop these skills with a new teacher? You do it by practicing them with feedback and the skills are gained and success comes. And it's not won easily and it takes time. So there are kind of three dimensions to teacher education. But it comes back to this question. What's the balance between the three? Yet another balance point. How much do you need to understand? And what's the balance between these three to get enough understanding to be able to do the job well? Fundamental questions that have to be addressed. So let's look at these three areas. Now you need a big understanding. It's absolutely pointless and stupid and indeed the evidence shows this very clearly. Just because you've got a degree in physics and you call it science, that doesn't enable you to go and teach a biology class because biology is called a science. You need to understand a lot about physics to teach physics and a lot about biology to teach biology. And that's true of every subject area. You can't pick it up quickly. And if you just understand a bit and just a bit ahead of the students, you're liable to mislead because you can't see the big enough picture. And if you look at what's going on in most education teacher training courses, the students tell us, most of it is irrelevant to what teachers actually do. Now we've got to take that message clearly, take it on board and look critically at what's going on. And in many countries, there's too little time in the practical skills of teaching out in schools. In other countries, the time spent in schools is high, up to 50%. That's far more appropriate because that's where very often the real learning of the skills comes working with an experienced and skilled teacher trying it out for yourself with practical daily appropriate supportive feedback the evidence suggests that the normal pattern in the world is a first degree is four years it's true in almost every country now for the mainstream subjects clearly things like medicine are longer if you're going to teach history, you need to have studied history for four years. You need enough background so you don't mislead. And that's true of any and every discipline. You can't shortcut that. And you need much more school-based with the school feedback from experienced practical teachers. And it develops. You start by watching. You start by trying bits of lessons. You move on to take whole lessons under supervision till eventually you're going on your own. And what we need in the more academic side is it must be research-based. And a lot of it is not. We've got to be honest. It's a collation of opinion and experience. But we only need just enough to make sense of learning. And it's got to be focused tightly to the real job that's going on in school teaching. You can expand it later. You can take extra courses even de extra degrees. But what you need for the practice of teaching, let's focus it tightly on that. Naive belief, 
<clears throat> the world is full of naive beliefs in all areas of life. Sadly, things which are not based on evidence. So we have this assumption that training is essential. Training will bring benefit. You can solve any problem by training. And the more training, the better it's going to be. And indeed, training can solve any teacher problems. If only they were trained more and they listened to what they were taught. I've heard that kind of statement made. And outsiders can train teachers. And a kind of logic comes up which is utterly naive and misplaced and it just follows through. Where is the evidence that training brings benefit? It depends on what training, what people, what situation, how it's done. And training by outsiders is an insult. We wouldn't bring an outsider in to train a policeman how to do his job or her job. We wouldn't bring an outsider in to tell a doctor how to learn more medicine. Why should it be different in teaching? I'm making that blunt statement. We might argue about what we mean by an extended period, but not just a year or two. If you've not taught, you have absolutely no right to tell others how to teach. And that is also true. The research evidence shows it. Once you leave the classroom or whatever teacher situation it is in a school, you quickly lose the reality of the classroom situation. Things are moving so fast. But also you move on. So you've got to, if you're going to teach people to teach, you've got to have extended teaching experience yourself and you've got to keep in touch with reality by keeping on doing it in some way. And indeed the quality of the training that's offered to would-be teachers is far, far more important than the length and nature of that training. And that's true in every area of life. Training is not the magic answer. Quality of training. But again, it raises the question, what do we mean by quality? I hope we can tease that out a little bit further in this presentation, which is designed to bring the research evidence to bear, and you will find perhaps this very uncomfortable. But research is sometimes very uncomfortable. Now, let's look at the world in broad terms, the kind of current practices. Now, there are variations on this and overlaps between them, but just dividing it into three possible routes. One route is a four-year degree followed by a one-year course at diploma or master's level. In many countries, that's the normal standard route to enter secondary education, and it's also a route into primary education the second route is this, a typical four-year degree. But this time, half of it, or roughly half of it, is the subject you're going to teach, and half of it is courses in education. So you do half, say, in history and half in education. And you come out at the end of the four years as a supposed qualified teacher. There is some teacher practice in schools built in. The third route is a four-year degree in education, in an education faculty or school. And in there, you're taught courses in the relevant subjects. Now, that is a typical route for primary schools, although it can be used in secondary education. And indeed, in some countries, it's quite common for secondary teachers to be trained that way. Now, let's look at these three critically on the basis of evidence. The first one is the typical route. It has one huge advantage. You don't decide you're going into teaching until you've finished your first degree, your four-year degree. And it, postponing a decision in this is valuable. Now, it's clear research evidence to show how many people change their minds about what they want to do during their degree. Now, that's probably the best model for both primary and secondary teachers. Take a degree in secondary, it's going to determine what you can teach. In primary, no it doesn't. It's giving you a broad education. 
and the evidence shows very clearly that it's of enormous value for people who want to enter primary teachers teaching and that questions all these education courses that they're forced through do we really need them this kind of a way is offered in some countries for secondary teachers the problem is that the students got to decide at the outset straight from school that they're going to go into teaching evidence shows that's not a good way to go and in fact in a four-year degree there's not enough in the subject courses. You don't get enough of your history or your physics or whatever you're going to teach because time is taken up with education and school placements. So you don't have the big enough picture and you're in danger of misleading students. That's quite common for training for primary teachers, although in some countries it's used for secondary as well. Again, it's got that problem. You're committed to teaching from the outset straight from school, say. That's not a good way to go. And the picture is that there's far too many education courses. But it does offer over four years scope for many teacher school placements that can be developmental. We have to raise questions of that route, but route one, the evidence suggests that's by far the best way to go of these three broad patterns. Let's ask some fundamental questions about all of this. What is the best way to equip a person to be an effective teacher? There's the big question of all. Societies have got to address that. But if they're going to address that, they've got to address an answer and come to an answer on the basis of evidence. And this presentation is trying to bring out some of the highlights of the evidence with references at the end where you can follow them up. Now in teaching, you learn by doing. Now that assumes that you know what you're talking about. You've got a degree in a subject or a qualification in a subject that makes you competent in the subject. But you learn by doing. It's an apprentice model. And that model is used so successfully in many other areas of life. Look at the clinical years in a medical degree. Look at the years of the junior house doctor having qualified an apprentice model you learn by doing where there is somebody, often a consultant, supervising and directing and giving you feedback. But then you ask the question, where? Do you learn to be a good teacher by sitting in courses in a university class? No. You learn the practice of teaching by doing it. Yes, you'll make mistakes. You learn from mistakes. You don't learn from successes. You learn from the things where things go wrong. But you're under supervision. Someone's carrying the can. Someone's directing you, giving you positive, directive feedback. That is always true. And if you look at the whole apprenticeship type of models that exist in wider societies, it's an established way that works well. But you need to start with a degree or an equivalent to that in the subject to be taught. And then you've got an apprentice to experience teachers, to learn the skills of being a teacher. It is a very skilled occupation, greatly devalued in many societies. It takes time to gain it. And you don't need all these courses to make sense of the teaching experiences. You need some, but we're doing far too much. We've got the balance wrong and the evidence shows it. But you see, you need to be accredited. As the skills are gained, you get feedback from your mentor in the school. You've gained the skills. You gain confidence. You've learned. You move on. You take more responsibility. You try new things out. It's a developmental process. Now, we need more research in areas like this. Some of them we've got a bit of. We need more. And these are issues that have got to be addressed. Where is the evidence that initial teacher training develops better teachers? There is a lot of circumstantial evidence that suggests that there are some people that just seem to take to it more naturally and they do the real learning in the schools and they blossom. And what they get in their academic courses is largely an irrelevance. 
talk to teachers in classrooms, that's what they'll say. Then the next question is, great pressure on in-service teacher training, as if it's going to solve all the problems of the world in education. Is there any evidence that enhances teacher quality? We'll look at some evidence later which questions that. What kind of training? It's not the amount of. What kind of training is more effective? That needs to be explored further, but there's some evidence there too. You learn best on the job. Who are the best people? Well, the best people have to be those who are experienced teachers. You trust them, they trust you. You try things out, they give you feedback. And the evidence certainly challenges that. The evidence shows that people teach in line with the ways they were taught when they were at school. So what's the point of teacher education if it doesn't change pedagogical practice? We're stuck. These are major questions that need addressed. Now what research suggests? Collating studies, several studies, to see what are the common features of excellent teacher education. Now this is largely on the basis of how people have seen them, their opinions, but it does give us some pointers. When it's good, the whole thing is underpinned with a clear shared vision. All the taught courses, the school practices, all coming together following a kind of shared agenda. We're focusing on the learner and the way they're developing. And indeed, all that's taught in a college is taught in the context of the practice out in the schools. They're tied together. And that should be the largest element by far. So the whole thing is integrated, brought together. This is what the evidence suggests. This is what students tell us once they've been through it. And we know what the acceptable standards and practices are because they're shared, they're agreed. And everything guides and evaluates is brought together consistently. And those who teach in a school of education and those who are teachers in schools, they're working together. They share the same agenda. That very often is not true. And we rethink the whole use of the approaches we adopt. I've just put down a few of them that have come up from research evidence. And these are used in some places, but very often they're neglected. So there are some pointers from the feedback that we get, useful to guide us and help us. So based on what research suggests, I'm going to suggest a six-stage process. This is what the evidence points us towards. And I'm not saying this dogmatically. I'm not saying that this doesn't need amendment or adjustment, but it gives us a framework of discussion and thought. All would-be teachers start with a four-year subject degree. The evidence shows that's essential for secondary and incredibly valuable and useful at primary levels. Then you have a very intensive short course, just a few weeks. I'm going to expand this in a moment. And then they're out into schools. And they spend a long time in the schools, up to two years. At the end of that period, having gained a lot of experience knowing the job, they have one semester training, maybe even a little bit less. And this is looking back at what they've learned in the schools and saying, now, here is why you found this. It's got to be tied together. And then you're launched. But there's ongoing development doesn't just stop there we learn throughout life something we try to encourage but we need to do it ourselves now I'm going to expand these just a little bit further bit of a complicated cluttered table let's just look at it step by step the four-year degree whatever subject they wish now that depends on their abilities their school qualifications and so on and then at the end they may decide they want to enter a teaching career 
And if it's an attractive option, and that's controlled by wider society, then many will choose that. And then after the degree, before the next school year starts, they have a short course, up to four weeks. And this is just the essentials for surviving in the classroom. So they know what's facing them. Now that model has been taken from university structures where it works well. There was a three-week course surviving as a teacher when you started your teaching career in universities. Why not use it in schools? Then you spend anything up to two years working with a mentor in the school. The mentor is given a bit of time off to do the job. Someone is experienced with a proven track record, usually in your, the same subject you're teaching in secondary schools. Support, discussion, guidance, you're learning on the job. Then you step out from it for a short time. And now you look at what you've done. You bring it together, you ponder it, look at the underpinning ideas. But the people who teach that, these tutors, they're experienced teachers, they're seconded from schools. Evidence suggests that after five years, you've started to lose touch. So that's why it's suggested up to five years. They have high credibility. They've done the job and they've done it recently. Now you have a full teaching load. You're going, you're on your own. You're no longer monitored intensively. But there's ongoing development. And short courses are offered, but they've got to be relevant to the real job of teaching. They could be updating subject knowledge, so important in the sciences where things change so rapidly. Updating in pedagogy, could be introducing new developments in society, new legislation or whatever. And these courses are certificated. You go through them, you get the credit, you've completed them, not by an examination. There are many other ways to do it. And indeed, if you want to go for a promotion, you may require that certain courses and that you've got these and are certificated having done them will be essential starting points. That's the fundamental question. I'm going to suggest eight things. Again, this is based on evidence that's been pulled in from research. The first thing that every would-be teacher needs is how to control a class. That is the central classic, most important thing. You can be brilliant at everything, but if you can't control the young people, and adolescent young people sometimes are difficult to control. And in our schools at all levels, there are children, young people, students, who've got real social problems, and they need support and help, and it's not easy. That's the number one thing. You need to know what the curriculum's all about and where it's going in primary school across several subjects and secondary perhaps in one subject and you need to focus what's going on asking the question why is learning sometimes difficult what's the source of the problems now the research evidence on that is clear cut it's often not taught in schools of education and then the strategies the approaches to teaching why do we do things certain ways? What's best for what? What's best for a given outcome? Assessment lags behind everything else in education at the moment. It's holding things back, largely because of political interference. When you look at assessment, there are really good ways forward. There's a lot of research there. And then the practicalities. How actually do it does a school operate today? It may have changed in the time from when the student has left school and gone through their training. How does it operate? What are the kind of ground rules? What are the principles? What can you and cannot do? And then are so important with young people, teachers have to relate to parents. Where is that trained for? How do we relate to parents? What do parents want? The evidence is there. How do they respond? What do we do with difficult parents? Parents who never come to a parents meeting. All these problems have to be addressed. And then how do we interpret research? We want to equip teachers to be able to read good digests of research, and there's often a lack of them, so that they can update, take things forward, rethink things through, move education forward. The teachers are the future, but the research has got to be there and accessible to them, and they have to know how to interpret it 
and apply it in the classroom. Now there's a kind of an agenda of things based on a lot of evidence. Let's look at the school experience. We're arguing very strongly on the basis of evidence of an apprenticeship model. So much is based on what actually goes on in the school with a trainee teacher learning on the job. Let's say we've got two years and we've put it into six terms. Now different countries organise it differently, but just for the sake of argument. The first term, you're observing classes, helping teachers, leading small parts of lessons, and you've got time off to prepare. And there's regular mentoring. Now, that can vary considerably, depending on the student and the progress they make. You then move on quite a bit more. You take quite a lot of lessons. There's a lot of supervision, but not total. But you've still got quite a bit of time for preparation. Now, you're largely on your own. There is some supervision and guidance. Mentoring is still there, and you're still getting a bit of extra time to do preparation. And then really you're on your own. But you get a bit more time to prepare and you get a little bit of feedback to see everything's going okay. But it's not very close. Now, it's only a kind of picture model and it can be adjusted and adapted in any way. But it shows a kind of developmental process and I've tried to quantify it a little bit. Then you come out and you look at what your experience has taught you. And then university faculty taught by people with high credibility. You're now interpreting it all and giving an underpinning to it. Now it makes a lot more sense. But much of it is taught by discussion, debate and group work. It's not a series of lectures. Now there's a kind of a model for a way forward. It's developed from evidence, but the model may be far from perfect and it may need to be adjusted quite a bit. But it gives a starting point for discussion and debate. But it is based on the evidence that is there from studies. What kind of questions we've got to ask? Many places you're not allowed to ask that question. It's just assumed that they're good. Where is the evidence? Supposing you just remove them completely. What difference would it make? Now, you can't do that to test it out, but it's an interesting question to discuss and ponder and look at. Ask teachers in their first few years of teaching to look back. They'll give you vast feedback on that one, and it'll be uncomfortable. It always is. Where's the evidence about this? The evidence suggests that apprenticeship-type training is the key. But it may not be the whole picture yet. And the balance point. What about that research project? What's the evidence about that? It's pretty negative. That happens to be true. Many students, when they start their teaching, they look back and they're not very positive about their training. Bits of it they're positive about, particularly their school placements. But an awful lot of the rest they see as artificial, unreal, unrelated to life and irrelevant. Ask them. It's uncomfortable. OK, we've got to look at it and do something about it. Yes, some research is needed. Bring that together. Formalise it more. But the pointers do point in a certain direction. We've got to rethink this and take the evidence seriously. Now, when you've got into the profession, you've got what we could call on-the-job training or in-service training. The fashionable, in-trendy phrase today is continuing professional development. CPD for short. It's just a fancy phrase for in-service training. Now, there are real dangers with this. And again, the evidence shows it. You can get outsiders coming in, telling teachers what they should be doing. No credibility. That gets nowhere. If you haven't done the job and are not doing the job, what right have you to tell other people how to do it? It's interesting looking at a subject like dentistry to see the extent to which 
dentists who are in practice, experienced, often leaders of our dental team, are invited in to do some teaching, discussion and group work with students. Their credibility is enormously high. They know what it's all about. Medicine does the same. Why don't we do that in teaching? Someone comes in and does a brilliant presentation, highly polished. They've got the time to prepare. But there's no opportunity for feedback, discussion, and it's unrealistic. It washes over people, oohs and ahs, they're impressed. What difference does it make? Where is the evidence? The evidence suggests they don't make much difference. Then you get put in discussion groups. But no one in the group really knows what they're talking about. And I remember on one occasion where they put you in discussion groups to discuss critical thinking. No one in the groups knew what critical thinking actually was. So they got nowhere. And the report backs showed that. What's the point? There are dangers in CPD, but they are solvable. CPD can provide the clear landmarks. Then you go into discussion on how you're going to implement it. Not a polished presentation and nothing else. Not discussion where you're starting, where you don't know what you're talking about. Sometimes someone from outside can come in and just update teachers. It may be an educational policy, it may be a political policy, maybe a development in society, where teachers need to be informed. That's very useful. Some subjects are developing rapidly with new discoveries, particularly in the sciences and applied sciences, but it can apply in any discipline. An expert coming in, maybe a university lecturer in that discipline, updating people, very valuable. And updating teachers on technologies as they come available. That may be an expert on something to do with IT. But technologies do become available and we need training on these. Very valuable. Someone can come in and bring a distillation of research evidence on some topic or theme and distill it out and then have a written handout that just has summarised the distillation in language that's accessible to teachers. Very valuable. Or you can get groups of teachers to come together, perhaps groups of teachers in one subject discipline. Maybe there's an adjustment to the curriculum materials or the assessment system or there's been some development subject. They group together and they engage with that. They've all got the background and the discipline. They engage the materials and work together as to how they're going to work this into the way they're going to teach. Or you get groups of teachers to come together and they're working on some key issue, a problem that they face in some area of their work, and they're looking for sharing it, supporting each other, and looking for answers that where they can help each other. Now, all of these are incredibly valuable for CPD. And these do occur we need to extend them further. But what's the evidence? Now the evidence of what we've got at the moment from various studies, we need more evidence on this. There is some very good stuff going on. And teachers engage with it and are positive about it. They often come away with a buzz from some course they've attended. The idea that teachers are the problem is contradicted by the evidence. But usually they can't implement it. And it builds up frustration. Now that's what the evidence shows. And the reason they can't implement it, maybe there's not time. Curricula are overcrowded. We need to prune them back. Teachers don't decide that. The assessment system is rewarding recall recognition. So what's the point of bringing in something useful if it doesn't bring rewards? There are policies at local or national levels that don't allow it. Very often there just aren't the resources. Something good. The evidence is there. It's going to be good. Teachers want to do it, but they can't get the resources, the materials or whatever it is. And very often school inspectors come in and they don't support the changes, and they just condemn them. 
These are the practical things where the evidence shows there are problems. But if we bring CPD and bring it into a cohesive plan, maybe there's a good way forward. But the problems rarely are caused by teachers. The problems are caused by the systems around the teachers. Let's change the systems and release the teachers and let's move it all forward. There's a positive message there for us. Let's just bring it together in the last moment or two. I think we all accept that, and it's accepted in the majority of people across most nation states today. But they need to be have the highest levels of expertise and understanding relating to what they teach. I've seen, for example, in my own country, people being expected to teach a modern language after a 16-week crash course in a modern language. You can't do it. To have any baseline, you need a four-year degree. We're selling our students short. So that is essential. And in some countries, there are clear criteria laid down about who can teach what and at what level based on their background, training and knowledge. And the four-year degree becomes a central feature of it. We need to know how schools actually work, the practicalities, and you learn that on the ground. Observation, discussion, involvement. That's the key. But there's a demanding specialised skill set that effective teachers have got. Watch an effective teacher. It's an eye-watering experience. You stand back in awe. You see people doing the most wonderful things and really turning young people on to learning and giving them insights and revelations that are truly amazing. Let's see if we can develop more people with these skills. But you learn that by observation and practice. And you get feedback. Positive, affirmative feedback, not negative, condemning feedback. And that's done in schools. Here are the clear, clear messages from research. If you look now at continuing professional development, the in-service training side of things, we've got to address the problem. A lot of it's good, but implementation's got to to be addressed. We've got a blockage, a gap. We've got to look at that. And we've got to run it in a way that's the right format to fit the desired objectives. And I suggested a few of these further back. Great possibilities there. Wonderful, exciting possibilities there. Talk to teachers. They will tell you right after the thing. That was great. Or they come out, what a waste of time. Let's make them all great, or as many as we can. Now this has been a quick skirmish through looking at the evidence from research as it relates to teacher training and teacher support. There's a list of references here. It's not them all by any manner of means, but hopefully... By looking at the references in these key papers, it'll give pointers into other areas. The work of Dan Yilson, I put up one website and one book at the beginning. And then there's a whole series of studies by people who are fairly eminent in their field. From various cultures and countries. If you look at, for example, the PhD thesis of El Sawaf from Egypt, work done both in Egypt and in Scotland, this raises interesting questions and has wonderful insights, and you can download that thesis, insights into the actual impact or perhaps lack of impact of CPD. So if you look down that list, taking the references from them, We'll give starter points into the literature. We've got to take this seriously, address the issues, and indeed there are things where we've got to put our house in order. Yes, teachers need trained, 
we need continuing professional development. But what we're doing at the moment in initial teacher education, question marks have to be raised. And what we're doing with CPD, we've got to look at the mismatch between good quality stuff and possibilities of implementation. We need to move things forward. We've pushed the boulder a bit further up the hill as we tried to bring research evidence to bear on major topics in education. In the next presentation, we're going to look at ed assessment. If we're honest, assessment controls what's happening in schools. Should it? There's a vast research base related to assessment from all over the world. Let's look at this. What can we learn about assessment from the evidence from research? And that is us moving on to the next stage in our looking at research and education.